The asbestos issue is not a thing of the past. It, it continues to this day. We want to end this man-made disaster. So let's ban asbestos. Okay, so um, my talk is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to talk about why we're here um, in a sense of how we got here. And just not, not to fight with Dick, but it, it's not just a failure of public health. And um, because there's been an active opposition to public health that's gone on for two centuries or so at least. And I'm also going to give you a suggested some thoughts on how that can be stopped, basically by modifying the methods that were used by the people who have brought us all here um, in the first place. Um, so first, let me just say, this is not a problem of a few bad scientists or a few bad people or any bad people. It is a problem with a barrel that is rotten. And unfortunately, almost any scientist or other person, politician or other, who gets in the barrel gets made rotten. So it's not rotten people. It's a system. And that system is all about money. And the suppression of science is not an anomaly, but it is a byproduct of how we've organized ourselves in the society and how power is maldistributed. That is, we in this room don't have much. Some people who are making hundreds of millions of dollars of contributions to politicians have a lot. And they make that contribution off of the money they've made by not having to protect it, the people who you're here representing. Um, if companies can foist health and safety and environmental costs onto customers, workers, and neighbors, they can walk away with more money than competitors, even putting them out of business. So the way the system works is if I'm a nice guy and I protect my workers and my consumers, my costs go up. If I'm not such a nice guy, I'm of the Koch brothers and I don't really care, I can make a lot more money. And those costs that I don't pay, called externalities in classical economics, are borne by the people in this room. What's the barrel look like? Well, the barrel's corporations, public relations firms, law firms. This is a barrel that applies to asbestos. This is a barrel that applies to everything else, most recently General Motors. Science advisory boards, regulatory agencies, junk scientists. At dinner last night, we were talking about a variety of hearings and uh, lawyers and scientists. And it's the same people, same lawyers for 40 years who've been representing companies, representing silica, asbestos, benzene, everything else. And in many cases, even the same scientists in quotes. Okay, Here's an example of a Public relations firms have led this and organized this originally, now law firms. Hill & Knowlton is a famous firm that organizes tobacco industry campaigns. Here's an advertising letter they sent out. We can use our methods like we use them for asbestos in health, saccharin in regulation, dioxin in health, lead in public health, vinyl chloride in cancer. So they're organized. But each of the advocacy groups dealing with each of these things, like this one, are not working together. They are working together with the same people, the same money, the same funding, the same techniques. Why it happens again? Well, here's the principle of society organized around capitalist industry, brought to you no less than Milton Friedman. The social responsibility of business is to increase profits and nothing else. We are the nothing else. Uh, the penalties for getting caught never approach the costs and advantages of increased profits. We all know that. Simply, there is no price for life. There is no amount of money that can separate, that can account for a life. So the costs are always higher, but even given the 
minor small penalties or compensation that's provided, those costs actually exceed the profits of all these companies. So these externalities are huge. That's why a lot of asbestos companies are bankrupt. When they have to start to pay the costs associated, just not all of them, just a small percentage of them. They lost so much money that they couldn't operate anymore. So the system is really predicated on shifting the costs. Now let's look at some examples of how this has gone on with asbestos. Beginning in the 1920s, MetLife, who uh, along with the Quebec Asbestos Mining Association, the asbestos mines, took out a mortgage on McGill. This is in the early documents, where they would get a where they would get a quid pro quo. I'm never going to figure that out, but you can see quid pro quo. So this is a quid pro quo that they paid McGill for in 1926. So what's some of the quid pro quo? In 44, they did a study and they found that. TB rates in miners, Canadian asbestos miners, were 300 per thousand. Compared to the province, 80. Compared to the rest of Canada, 51. Well, the quid pro quo was that they could publish this. In the open pit and quarry work, there's no apparent lung hazard. This is from 1933. They had the data by then. Uh, the t here's from 1939. Uh, uh, this is the publication of that Canadian data you just saw. The TB mortality rate in Thetford mines, by the way, that, that the data I show you is from 1930, although it wasn't published in corrupted form until 1944. Wasn't, that memo was summarized in 44 because the companies wouldn't let them publish their version. So here's Dr. Lanza publishing that there uh, was no increased TB rate. Just again, only a seven, six, eight-fold increase in TB? Nope, no difference. That's what the world saw. Here's a cancer study done in the Quebecus miners in 1957 and 8, done by the Industrial Hygiene Foundation, funded by the mining companies. The draft said a miner who develops asbestosis does have a greater likelihood of developing cancer. That was statistically significant. What did they publish? It seems fair to conclude that the asbestos miners in the province of Quebec do not have a significantly higher death rate from lung cancer. At the time, there was a published paper by the guy who wrote the threshold limit values that said if something is a carcinogen, the threshold limit value would have to be dropped by 100 to 500. I published that paper was in 1956, two years before this. His name was Stokinger. This letter went, this paper went to Stokinger. He published it in his journal. He sent a letter saying, ah, now I see. We don't have to worry about asbestos cancer. That if you drop the rate from 500 to 100 fold lower, the threshold, the standard, the exposure standard, it would be about what the current standard is, 0.1 fiber per cc. So had this data been made public, the true data, the threshold limit value would have been dropped to what it is now. Okay. So here's another one. They can't, the companies did a, not a cancer study by intent, but by mistake. They did a study of chrysotile asbestos in mice, and they found that the animals got cancer. So they met in, five years later in New York. Lanza, <coughs> the Met Mife, was the coordinator of this, the pivot man, as it were. Sent a letter saying, you must delete all cancers, references to cancer or tumors. And that's from my first slide. That's the actual deletion from the Vorwald Archives of the Armed Forces Institute. So the cancer findings were deleted. Not only that, in the published paper, which won awards in 1951 as the best paper published that year, uh, it said this is the complete results of the Gardner experiments. Well, it was the complete results except for the cancer findings. Okay, so. Um, that's, that's that one I've shown you already. So let's look at, this is a meeting of Kwama in the 60s, mid-60s, where they're trying to deal with Dr. Selikoff. His latest paper is given wide publicity. It's a problem for them. So they need to set up a way of developing counter-propaganda. Okay, counter-propaganda. So they went back to McGill. The counter-propaganda person for them was J.C. McDonald. And it was a priority matter. So they hired J.C. McDonald, 
And this is McDonald starting his research on the Canadian miners. He went to a meeting in South Africa, a big, huge meeting on pneumoconiosis. He asked this question. I know you're not all scientists, but I think even probably a seven-year-old could understand how stupid this question is that he asked. Okay, can an inaccurate instrument like the midget impinger give an accurate result? Now, of course, you all know that the real answer to this question is yes, because even a broken watch is correct twice a day. But the question is, would you use a broken watch to determine the safety factor for exposure to asbestos or anything else? Probably not. He was told he shouldn't, but he went ahead and did it. And so what he found out was that there was a no relationship between exposures and cancer because he was using the wrong method. In fact, he found out it was an inverse relationship. Based on his real data from his study, the higher the asbestos study counts, the lower the cancer rate. I can explain that, but it's complicated. So they went through and they, quote, arbitrarily changed the data, deleting the points that didn't fit his previous theory. And this study is the main study that's now used currently, currently to justify the fact that chrysotile does not cause mesothelioma, along with some others. It's non-trivial, these changes. Okay. So what is to be done? Okay, this is, we need to look at the people who were doing this. Grover Noquist, who's the head of the <coughs> Taxpayers Foundation, something like that. His heroes, Gramsci and Lenin. He's the most right-wing person in the United States in terms of theory. Gramsci's an Italian Marxist. Mussolini put him in jail in the 40s. But my, Gramsci figured out, trying to figure out why Marxist revolutions hadn't occurred spontaneously, that it was ideas that mattered, that the ideas that were dominant in the society were what prevented the society from moving forward. And what are those ideas? Well, I like to characterize them as a wagon train. These are the two main oppositional ideas in the United States. Wagon train, we're all collective. We go together in the wagon train, we share things, we protect each other, we work collectively. Of course, when we get where we're going, we set up our own little homestead. And don't get near somebody's homestead or they'll blow you away with an AK-47 now. Okay, so those are the two ideas, a communitarian idea and an individual responsibility idea. The idea that the people who are running the barrel have been able to promote completely is that individual responsibility and government are oppositional. And government, which is the only thing that can oppose corporate power, is undermined, degraded. Okay? So, Let's look at setting up an organization that puts these pieces together. Connections with regulators, science, science people in the middle with PR people to teach them how to talk in 15 second sound bits, blogging, viral videos, opinion pieces for this activity and for all the other vertical programs out there. For the people with benzene leukemia, for, for the people living around uh, West Virginia who are drinking that chemically purified coal cleaner, etc. For the people who are concerned about General Motors. By the way, just to make a, one little tidbit on the money issue, an emphasis issue, 13 people, which is a terrible tragedy, died from the, at least, from that ignition problem with General Motors, which was again a money problem. 50 to 75 people die every day from asbestos disease. Every day. Okay. They're worried, by the way, that those 13 people may put General Motors out of, out of business. Okay. Okay. So what it's to do, mobilize, use op-eds, books, movies, TV, radio talk shows, conferences, awards. These are the methods that the, the right is using. Okay, they're using it, they're, well, that's the reason they, they know about ideas. They created Cato, Heritage, Manhattan Foundation. They're on C-SPAN all the time with conferences. They have something called ASH.org, which is a similar organization, except it's all scientists that are being doing, paid for by every corporate criminal that you can think of to justify their acts. Okay. Um, 
And I might say that no one's ever gone to jail for any of these things, although I almost went to jail for releasing the Vioxx documents. The Lily committed a crime for doing the things in the documents. They never went to, never were even threatened with jail. Okay, and to leave you with Jim Keogh's quote, if you poison your boss a little bit each day, it's called murder. And you'll be convicted of that. If your boss poisons you a little bit each day, it's called the threshold limit value. Okay, so um, let me leave you with that. Um, thank you.